Sadistic Penguin Studios presents the At The Show Podcast with Tom Yumper Garcia. Okay, you people sit tight, hold the fort, and keep the home fires burning. And if we're not back by dawn, call the president. And Tony Chalsa Burt. I don't know this industry jargon, YP, MP, whatever, okay? All I know is that I cannot get a record contract. We cannot get a record contract unless I take these tapes. It's almost time. So grab a drink, get your popcorn ready, and join the film discussion with two guys from Chicago talking movies. Hello, and welcome to another episode of the At The Show podcast. I'm one of your co-hosts, Tom Yumper garcia and I'm with my other co-host, Tony LaChalsa Burt. How you doing, my man? Doing real good. How are you doing this evening? I am existing. That <laughs> is uh, definitely a way to live. <laughs> yes, yes. This week is just, uh, it sucked. But uh, I'm here to talk some movies, which is always a good thing. It is. Uh, it uh, sounds like you've been going through like what they call those practices before we get started in football, yeah. uh, like the uh, the long, long uh, two a days, two yes, practices. Yes, it's how it feels. It's, <laughs> life is kicking my ass right now. But um, always a good time to talk some movies with everyone and then get to uh, have some fun, right, man? I am excited. We got a lot of good movies to cover tonight that I think is going to cure my, yours, or anyone else's blues because uh, it's definitely. Uh, some hilarity and it's gonna be good man it's gonna be real good yes for sure my man for sure uh tone so we decided to go with some football movies this week because uh football has started it's becoming probably the main talk and main focus of most people in the sports world as well as kind of like that time where thanksgiving's coming up and we usually get those big football games coming up on thanksgiving towards the end of the year you get to those bowl games with college football we know i don't really watch college besides Illini football. Uh, but we uh, wanted to. Sam kind of threw me off with his little comment here. Uh, <laughs> but we uh, wanted. To I start... don't watch your life. I'm just yes. saying that this whole. We wanted to talk some uh, football movies, which can be, I guess, taken in many, many contexts. Is the word football? That's true, and that's what's really hilarity is. I actually biffed it, and then I actually realized. Hold on a minute. I could sell this one. So it's going to be good. It's going to be some good stuff tonight. Yes, sir. It's going to be some good stuff. But uh, let's get into our first segment, my man. And let's go in to what we have been watching this week. Let's get to it. That's a me. And also, what were you just watching? So what were you watching this week, my man? Two movies I've watched this weekend, total polar opposites of type of films, but the, the first one I watched was Outland, a movie that stars one Sean Connery, a Peter Boyle, um, directed by Peter Hyams, who has directed such classics as Sudden Death, The Relic, End of Days, Running Scared, um, the sequel to 2001, A Space Odyssey, 2010, the year we made contact, Peter Hyams. Um, this movie kind of gets lost a little bit in the fold of his uh, catalog. Released in 1981, it is uh, pretty much like a space uh, western. And um, definitely, if you are a fan of, well, you brought him up last week, the strong silent type, Gary Koopa, uh, this movie is pretty much a playoff of High Noon, Gary Cooper's classic from 1952, um, but this movie itself is really awesome because of just the performances by everyone in here from um, Peter Boyle and Sean Connery um, to also some other great performances by like James Sicking and Kika Markham. But you could see just right here in this clip and here in this performance, if you're not familiar with who Peter Boyle is, a great musical tie-in was um, he wa uh, John Lennon was the best man at his wedding. Uh, that John Lennon, yes, from the Beatles, but he's also uh, the dad from I, Lo uh, I Love Raymond, which had a couple laughs here and there. Drop by my office. We'll talk some more. I'll do that. The whole movie is pretty much them two going head to head up in space. So if you're looking for good action and actually a really good intimate setting 
um, set right on the moon of Jupiter. Um, check out Outland. It's a good one. You ever hear this one yet? I've heard of it, but I haven't seen it in so long. I really couldn't tell you like any parts that stuck out to me. So it'll be a movie I would have to go back and uh, look into. Yeah, it's really uh, a good one if you like Sean Connery. Um, one, like I said, it gets kind of lost in um, the fold. Um, a lot of cool... Uh, I like movies like this because generally you think of outer space, you think aliens are going to be involved, but it's generally just a really cool uh, story about like a power play up in space, which in, uh, is actually refreshing because, you know, um, you don't see too many space westerns, especially with uh, Sean Connery. Um, the next movie that I watched, the direct polar opposite, is Let's Go to Prison. A movie that is uh, directed by Bob Odenkirk, uh, to me, a legend in so many different ways, from Better Call Saul and Breaking Bad all the way to Mr. Show, which is just one of the greatest uh, sketch comedy uh, series of all time, but directing um, in the directing spot and also really cool, um, written um, by uh, Thomas Lennon, who you may be familiar with, um, the great... uh, the state that was on MTV in the early '90s, but also Reno 911 also popped in. Great performances in "I Love You, Man," which we've talked about on this show before. But the movie itself, "Let's Go to Prison," is honestly might be one of the most ridiculous movies I might have ever seen in my whole entire life. The cast is really actually pretty cool and deep for uh, a movie that uh, you with the the subject matter, which is pretty much. A guy who pretty much is a big jerk who pretty much gets uh, gets in trouble and has to go to prison, but pretty much uh, his life gets made into, well, turns into total hell. Someone might describe a situation that's unpleasant or confining as being like a prison. This is what they're referring to. Um, so much dark humor in this movie, but honestly, really ridiculous is the performance of one of my favorite, uh, actors of all time as Leonard, Michael Shannon, um, as the sadistic leader of the white kingdom, just really, really ridiculous. Chi McBride does a really, really great job in this Dylan Baker, uh, could go on forever. It's a good movie that if you just are looking to just, well, have some laughs, I I enjoy this one. Yeah, it's a pretty funny one. Uh, it's definitely out there. Uh, big fan of Bob, um, of uh, the guy from Le- Better Call Saul. I can't yeah. say his last name correctly for some reason. I can't pronounce it. But good <laughs> dude. Um, also, it's got the guy uh, from uh, the Aston Kushner, Kushner show, uh, Punked. Oh, yeah. He's married to uh, the chick from... Um, Forgetting Sarah Marshall. I can't even think of their names right now. What the hell's going on? <laughs> uh, Zach, what's his name? Zach, uh, you know who I'm talking about. In uh, Let's um, Go to Prison. He's his, he's his cellmate. Oh, you're talking about Dak Shepard. Dak Shepard, thank Dak you. Shepherd. Dak Shepard. Uh, yeah, I'm sorry. He's married to Kristen Bell. He's I was thinking, Bell. That was a moment of me overthinking that right there. I'm like, who? who? Yeah, Dak Shepard. He does a good job in this movie. It is mm-hmm. out there, though. Um, it's actually, it's really really out there so i'm glad you said that <laughs> yeah dak prescott no 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 that dak guy prescott. he has he has no knee that guy has no knee <laughs> um but uh so i watched two very very vastly different films uh this week the first was i was thinking about watching the ninth gate for a long time uh but with the 31 days of horror i really couldn't get into watching new new movies i had to go to actually old ones Um, Even though this is an older movie, uh, I hadn't seen it in a very, very long time. Now, I'm not a huge fan of Roman Polanski, the person. Uh, I do like Rosemary's Baby, and this film is actually his second trip into the occult world of The Ninth Gate, which was released, I believe, in 1999, if I'm not mistaken. Um, But it's a film with Johnny Depp, uh, Frank Lagella, and like it's... To be honest with you, it has so many twists and turns. You kind of know what's going on. You're constantly, it's not a slow burner at all. It's constantly pushing forward with a narrative of him finding this book that's supposedly written by the devil. He's comparing it to the other books around the world. It's off a book uh, called Ninth Gate, Gates of Shadows. 
but it's actually really interesting. Does it hold up to how I felt the first time I saw it? No, but it's still very, very entertaining. And it's not one of those scary films where you're uh, scared of it. It's more of a suspenseful mystery film. I wouldn't really consider this a horror film in, it, in any film. It's more of a suspense film, um, but it is enjoyable. I actually liked the. I wa- finished it up today in the morning uh, while I was doing some work, and it's actually a nice little uh, coast, you know, to watch because you can stop and look and see what's going on, and it's very. Uh, it keeps you drawn in the attention of the viewer, which is something that most movies these days really can't do. Have you seen this one, Tom? Oh, I love this movie. I love this movie quite a lot. Um, I remember specifically uh, 1999, I think you are correct, in the year it came out. I'm going to see it in the movie theater, and it was uh, like eight of us. And it was cool because, well, half of them were girls. And I'm like thinking to myself when we were going to see this movie, this is going to bomb. This isn't going to go well. Everybody enjoyed the movie. Um, This is around the time, too, like American Psycho came out. Um, and what I like about the Ninth Gate, there are a couple of humorous jokes in this movie that are actually really, really funny, but you have to be paying attention. Um, and and Johnny Depp does a really good job in this movie, I think. Um, really, really good job, actually, as um, as the lead. And um, honestly, uh, just his name, too, uh, Dean Corso, I just enjoy uh, a lot. But I enjoy, as you stated, it's like a ride. Um, from the very beginning, the way it starts, the music score is, is really, really good in the film. Um, I like where, not to give anything away, but where it ends because I'm um, trying to find those books and stuff, just really, really great. Humble brag, Tony hung out with the girls. <laughs> uh, watching movies like this, uh, yeah, it was pretty, pretty shocking. And Sam says, The movie's gonna bomb, maybe I'll be able to make out with one of the girls, Tony. <laughs> It didn't work. Um, And and, I mean, I could give you a flip story when uh, me and another guy decided that we were going to buy us uh, four extra Goo Goo Doll tickets because we were going to find four girls to come with us to Goo Goo Dolls. And we found no girls. And we ended up throwing these Goo Goo Doll tickets like in the parking lot as we had to go sit in this concert and be pissed off because we didn't find any girls. So it works sometimes it did not work for other times so the ninth gate girls come into the ninth gate boy that was a shock and i couldn't get them to go to the goo goo dolls i wouldn't go to goo goo dolls wow. either but <laughs> uh well i mean in 1998 yumper and you know you're in high school if you weren't going and you didn't want to go with the girls and you were going to be that picky over the bands i would have ditched you probably too you would've, yeah the goo goo dolls yeah, definitely you. wouldn't have gone that you could, um you could stay at home Definitely would have liked it to stay at home. Uh, So another film that I watched this week was actually inspired by the new Drafty Pod that came out uh, this Tuesday. They were talking about comedians, and Brian had been telling us he's been getting he was getting Sam on and Nick Morowski on uh, for the draft. After I did a show on Sunday, I was thinking about you know just comedians and films I haven't seen in a while. And me growing up, one of my biggest you know, influence is into anything into the art of movies or shorts was the Three Stooges. Uh, but before I discovered the Three Stooges, I actually watched this film at my aunt's. It was my dad's great aunt through marriage. We used to go to her house every uh, Sunday, every a couple of weeks, and she lived in Lamont, and we lived in the city. And they always had this film called March of the Wooden Soldiers, and it had Stan Laurel and Oliver Hardy in it, and it was a kids movie. But it had like Mickey, like a puppet Mickey Mouse. So it was like all like wacky stuff. And it got me into Laurel and Hardy. And then I saw uh, uh, Way Out West with them. And then eventually transitioned into the Three Stooges, which, you know, when we talk about comedy trios, we always mention either at, you know, Three Stooges or we talk about duels, Abba Costello. But uh, Oliver and Hardy really don't get mentioned as much as they should when they were really influential in bringing comedy to the big screen. They were like probably two of the biggest stars in the thirties. And unfortunately, when they got into their fifties and they kind of, you know, their fame dwindled, uh, this film was actually when they went out in the fifties to a trip overseas to perform their last, um, show like live two man show. And to be honest, it's masterfully done. It's the reason it didn't get recognized in the U- U.S. is because it's more of a international film, 
But Steve Coogan and John C. Riley are excellent as both Stan Laurel and Oliver Hardy. They play them like Steve Coogan and Stan Laurel's mannerisms. He plays them perfectly. Like they, I've seen shot by shot comparisons of them doing the, their dances, their skits, and it's complete. It's like it's beautifully done. They played really big tribute. The film also had you know, picks up on a little bit of dramatic effect, even though it's not real between the two as they were best friends. But this film is like excellent tone. Like I really love it. It's kind of sad because you know the ending of what happens to uh, Oliver Hardy towards the end of his life, as well as just the bond between him and Stan Laurel. How uh, when uh, when Hardy passed away, Laurel refused to perform with anybody else and basically retired. But until his death, was actually still writing material for the two duel, even though his partner was long gone. Um, is you know it's tragic, but it's a nice memento and tribute to these two comedians that kind of get lost you know in the shuffle when we talk about the icons and they should get more credit than they should uh i have a video coming out probably with next week on this film with a little more in-depth uh analysts on it which i already recorded voiceover i just have to do the uh, editing for the video but um i love this film it's it's i discovered it when it came out in 2018 and i still watch it just to uh because i'm in awe of everything that goes on in it have you seen this film? I watched it way back when it came out. Um, don't remember a lot about it, but I do remember that the performances were great. And as Sam stated, Steve Coogan is awesome. I could talk about Hamlet too for about 17 hours in a row. So I'll watch him in anything. And of course, John C. Riley, great, great actor. Um, you know, he has gotten sidetracked with doing things with Will Ferrell and more comedy, but generally when you come down to it, his bare bones is actually being a really good actor and he's great in this um and as you stated it's uh i you know i think we've had these conversations and i don't remember i like biographies um if you could pull it off and get good actors to do it really well and i don't know the stuff like this or don't know it enough you got me sold it could be about music it could be about um i love the movie hidden figures um you know you take any movie and it could be a true story but it's the performances it's are you selling me on the story and from what i remember this is uh definitely one of those so i'll definitely have to check it out and i'm a big fan of some of these other actors in the movie too like danny houston um danny houston's great um <clears throat> shirley henderson just a lot of really uh good performances from what i remember so definitely go check it out again yeah if you guys haven't seen it definitely check it out i think it's like for you could buy it for three bucks run it from amazon prime uh, it's definitely worth the buy. Like I really, really enjoyed it. Uh, I thought it it was it's beautifully done, nice timepiece. Uh, but yeah, it's some film that doesn't get talked about enough. And I remember when they were promoting it, they're on all the uh, talk shows, and you could really tell that the two comedians, you know, and actors really, really cherished uh, these two icons of the comedy industry. Um, just a good film. Very good picks, man. Very good picks all around. Thank you, my friend. Thank you. Uh, so that is what we watched this week. Let's know what you watched over at the At The Show pod. We are on Blue Sky at uh, sadisticpenguin.bksy.social, I guess it's called. But we are on Blue Sky. You can check us out there. And also, I'm at Lil Yumper on Blue Sky. And Tony, what are you on Blue Sky? The Chelsea? Uh, Tony Chelsea. Tony Chelsea. Chelsea's back. Chelsea's back. Chelsea's um, back. <laughs> also, if you want, you know, we got to get a code and maybe we can uh, set up an At The Show one. Oh yeah, yeah, we can do that too. You know, we'll get that. We'll get that all to you. You know, find us over there. That's going to be one of the places. Yeah, yeah. We have been uh, kind of transitioning over there, but um, that's what we watched this week. Some good films, man. A total like uh, potpourri, as I say. I and honestly, it. you could call me over and be like, "Dude, come into my movie theater. We're watching mm-hmm. these four movies back to back to back to back." And I'm going to say, okay, I got to get some popcorn and nachos because, man, we're going to have a good time. <laughs> <laughs> for sure, my man, for sure. Uh, before we get into our films that we are our main event of the evening, I want to, again, let everybody know that we are having a shirt that is for sale to help out our buddy Gordo. Uh, as for so those who haven't known, Gordo is going to be undergoing a pretty serious surgery and he's going to need some help with his medical bills i believe he meets he yeah he meets the doctor i believe one day if i'm not mistaken to get his surgery date and then he's going to uh find out when he'll go under and then he has his under and he's going to be basically having a 
you know, hopefully a speedy recovery, but those medical debts going to mount up and we want to help them out. So if you buy a shirt, all proceeds go to Gordo. I'm going to drop the link in the chat here. Uh, all proceeds go to Gordo. We already raised a nice chunk of money for him, but every little bit counts towards our guy. He's been a big supporter of us, the bums, as well as the 108. Uh, really, really good dude. We hung out, hang out with him like whenever we see him. And uh, he always tweets me uh, to hack into people's um, accounts because he wants me to be a hacker because <laughs> I work with computers. But uh, shout out to Gordo. Be sure to buy the Gummy Strong shirt for him to support him. Uh, we love you, my man. Yeah, I mean, excellent, excellent dude. Uh, please do this because if you don't um, and you run into Yumper, possibly a Sox game, this is good. This is actually going to be Yumper. I'm not mad. <laughs> if you do not get one so you know maybe get one yeah get one from our guy gordo well tone now it's time to get to the main event i know there's a big fight on tonight so i do kind of want to watch the fight between uh logan paul and no, not logan paul jake paul and mike tyson when they fight with those big pills on their hands you know so they're fighting with 16 ounce gloves so let's get to our main event and let's get into these football movies my man let's get to it all right let's start off with our first one Damn. We ain't moving. You killed him, Icebox. Hey, Rudy. You okay? Oh. Oh, Rudy. <laughs> oh. Peanut butter and jelly sandwich? Are you nuts? It's still good. You'll never get anywhere treating your helmet like a lunchbox, son. What is that? Cheetos. Crunchy or puffed? Puffed. Wimp. <laughs> 1994 is Little Giants, directed by Dwayne Dunman. The, the way he pronounces he spells his name is great. It's D-U-Wayne, Dwayne Dunham. Known for being an editor on Star Wars 5, 6, and Bill and Ted's Adventure. Excellent adventure. So he didn't really have too many big motion pictures, but he did a lot of editing. Uh, the film stars Rick Moranis, Ed O'Neill, Chawana Waldron, Devin Sana, and Sam Horgan. The movie had a box office of 19 million and a budget of 20 million. So this one is a loser in the box office. This is one of my picks. This is a film I grew up with with my brother. And the way I discovered this film is pretty crazy. I don't know if you remember the store um, in the backyards. I don't know if there was one by you, Tom, but there was a score, store called Omni, which is like a grocery store. Mm -hmm. Oh, yeah. So Omni was open, and every time we went shopping, like it used to be a thing where we, me and my brother used to go with my mom grocery shopping. I think it was every Tuesday. When we would go, they would have like the little TVs and the electronics department, and this movie would be playing. And we never knew what it was until we saw it at the video store and rented it. And then we eventually bought it, and we watched it like all the time. You know, Hot Hands, Icebox, you know, Ed O'Neill in a kid's movie. He was mostly known for Al Bundy at the time. You know, Rick Moranis. Uh, this is one of my uh, favorite kids' movies growing up, and it has a ton of football in it. Uh, and it's pretty, still pretty hilarious till today. Have you seen this one? Oh, yeah. I mean, it, it, nostalgia is a crazy thing. Because, I mean, honestly, you remember the video store it, being able to be rent. I remember seeing the box. I mean, you could say it was a failure, I guess, at the box office, which you're right. But as far as being remembered in my mind, um, you when you picked it at the top of your list, I was literally saying to myself, uh, this is a classic. You know, this is like a football version of some of the baseball movies we talked about earlier in the baseball series. Every season, you got a, two great performances. Uh, we could do a whole show, which I'm sure we will one day on Rick Moranis. Mm -hmm. Um, and then you got Ed O'Neill, who of course is great in everything I've seen him in. Um, a great Thanksgiving movie that he's in is Dutch. Oh, um, but yes, that, but uh, that being said, it's a, a really great – when you can get to a sports movie where you can get – I don't want to even use the word, the cliche opposite coaches, two sides, but it plays so well. It's like my version. It's like a lot of like those uh, erotic thrillers. You know, all you need is two people, and they're doing exactly what you want them to do when you're watching this movie, and that's these two. It's kind of crazy. I compared an erotic thriller to uh, Little Giants, but I guess I'll have to look at myself later in the mirror for that. But uh, wow! That... <laughs> wow. <laughs> the funny thing is, when I was reading like research for this film, and there really isn't a lot. I mean, it's a kids' film, but uh, you know, the story is that Rick Moranis is a single dad with his daughter. Basically, he kind of raised her as a tomboy, 
which he got into football. And Kevin, um, um, uh, got Kevin O'Neill. Ed O'Neill is his brother named Kevin, who is a like former player, hometown hero. And he did kind of clash, you know, he's a dorky one. He kind of is like the black sheep and his brother's like the famous one. Well, the original story called for the mom to die on Rick Moranis' side of his character. And they actually rewrote it to where the mom left him out of respect for Rick Moranis because he, his wife had actually previously passed within the past two years. They wanted to be respectful to him, uh, not to have to act it out, which I thought was pretty cool by the writing team. Also, uh, Gary Busey and Randy Quaid were originally cast as the leads. Ooh, that would have been a lot of fun. Can you imagine Gary Busey going ape shit on like little kids or football? <laughs> <laughs> this is a- after the accident, Gary Busey. So I'm guessing he was like uh, crazy. You know, this <laughs> it reminds you ever seen this movie called Surviving the Game? Oh, I love Surviving the Game. I mean, and- th- what am I? <laughs> I one of the jokes we used to make the whole time. <laughs> never mind. Yeah, we'll Prince talk about it. Like, we can go off for on Prince Henry Stout. Uh, there's a scene where like they're like because uh, the one kid who's like out there with his dad, he's uh-huh. like one of the ones hunting him or whatever, and they throw the guy over like the cliff or whatever, and the kid's like, dang, dang, dang. yeah, dang. It like the, it's like the biggest weasel I've ever heard. Yeah, but uh, great movie though, Gary Busey. I mean, Silver Bullet, man. Yeah, but that film, Surviving the Game, he has a monologue where he talks about his dog as a kid. And me and my brother still laugh this about was that. A, like, a, if somehow Silver Bullet was like a spinoff of this and Corey <laughs> was one of the little giants and, well, Busey was the coach. Oh, God. <laughs> in, in, like, Gary Busey after the accident. But yeah, this film is uh, awesome. It has a John Madden, of course, appears in it. You have, you know, the annexation of Puerto Rico as a last play. Um, Henry Shearer is the announcer. For the game, uh, it's got like a, everything, and you got Spike, who eventually goes on to become a roller skater in Brink, you know, as the football player. It's an enjoyable game, uh, movie, and it's pretty funny, you no know, funny then, and still funny kind of as an adult. So, yeah, good stuff. Uh, yeah, definitely. And like I said, it's cool for me. It's kind of same thing with music. Like I don't like outgrow a band that I've listened to. You just kind of keep it around, and this is what this movie is. You can go back to it and still enjoy some of the same laughs you did the first time you saw it yeah for sure so if you haven't seen this one check it out it's worth it and it is a football movie uh but uh let's get into your film tone they think they are gonna gut you and leave you laying on the highway with your insides hanging out of the so that goddamn buzzes to eat your no playing asses coach you're gonna have a stroke nineteen ninety nine's any given Sunday directed by Oliver Stone, who also directed films such as Platoon, Wall Street, Born on the Fourth of July, The Doors, Natural Born Killers, and Nixon. The film stars Al Pacino, Cameron Diaz, Jamie Foxx, Elo Kuje, James Woods, and Dennis Quaid. It had a box office of a hundred million dollars on a fifty five million dollar budget with a hundred and ninety two thousand in home entertainment sales. Tell and tell me why you picked this one. Uh, what the most amazing thing is when you bought the original DVD copy, it came with the music video on there for uh Willie Beeman, and we would just watch the music video over and over because it's the most ridiculous. The movie is ridiculous, it's huge to me. I don't know if there's a bigger, like, in grandeur sports movie. I mean, it's just it just seems huge in scale. Lots and lots of actors doing lots and lots of ridiculous things. Um, going from, I mean, you could just pick this all out. James Woods, ridiculous. Matthew Modine, ridiculous. Al Pacino, really, really ridiculous. Um, you know, it even's got the guy who, uh, and I don't know his name off, and I'll figure it out here in a second. But the dude who's in the program, the big muscular dude, uh, what's his name? Yeah, uh, I have we'll his figure, name. I'll figure it out here in a second. Andrew but, something, Andrew Radinsky. Um, but like to see him even bigger in this movie, um, it just really big in scale. And you know, I, I've seen pretty much every Oliver Stone movie, and this movie it does feel like an Oliver Stone movie in one way, and in another way, it kind of feels like a uh, Michael Bay movie. Um, it feels very big and loud. Um, 
and I always found it really interesting that the names of the football teams, you know, obviously they couldn't get the real name. So always interesting, ridiculous names for some of the football teams, but uh, very big in scale. For sure. Very big in scale. Uh, his name was Andrew. Oh my God. You're making me pronounce this game. Brian Narski. Yeah, that's what it is. I can look at it. Brian Narski. Yeah. That guy is fucking gigantic. Uh, this film cracks me up because of the speech that Al Pacino gives. Uh, they, everybody, they consider it like a very inspirational speech. I always makes me laugh because it's the Al Pacino yell. <laughs> like that's what this is the way he talks. <sighs> uh, when doing research for this tone, I found that you know, um, Mr. Oil himself, Sean Diddy Combs, was actually cast as Willie Beeman, oh. and apparently he had scheduling conflicts. But they, the Lord. they said that he was so horrible at playing a quarterback, he couldn't throw the ball. <laughs> that it was glad he left. So I'm guessing maybe they told him to leave and he used scheduling conflicts. As a, But when Jamie Foxx took over, they said it was like a natural fit. He's a natural athlete. Jamie Foxx is very talented musically and uh, as an actor. Uh, the names in this film are like ridiculous. Like Cat Rooney is Dennis Quaid. And oh, like Dennis Quaid is, is overly top, really. I don't want to say Quaid. Bad, I don't want to even say bad. But just the way he acts in this movie is just, it's too much at times. Yeah, apparently for uh, Jamie Foxx's role, Willie Beeman, they tried to get Chris Tucker, who turned down the role. Uh, For Tony D'Amato, which is actually Al Pacino's role, they offered it to Robert De Niro, who turned it down. Originally, they wanted, Warner Bros. wanted Clint Eastwood to actually be in the role, but he wants to direct it, and they're like, no, you can't do that because we're giving it to Stone. And Pacino was her second <laughs> second choice, and he happily t- agreed to take it because he was tired of playing gangsters and police officers. Apparently, uh, also this film comes with a, the one of the best songs from LL Cool J. I shut him down, <laughs> <laughs> and one of the best movie stories was when Jamie Fox went on TV and said that LL Cool J was taking his role too serious as the running back to the point where they got into fights <laughs> on set because he was taking, he's acting like, he's like, you really think you're a damn player? And they started fighting him to where LL punched him in the face. And uh, apparently now they're friends. Um, and just honestly, it's ironic that we uh, bring it up because announced just this week uh, coming to Netflix, January 17th, Cameron Diaz is coming back to the screen with Jamie Foxx in an action movie called back in action. So um it must i mean i always like to hear the stories because that means that obviously from way back here they had some connection to keep them working on a brand new movie um which mean that they've obviously had a positive experience on this well he says baby oil makes the pigskin slippery yes it does my man <laughs> uh but that speech i was just telling you about i told him that patino makes his final rally rallying his final rallying speech the team before night the playoff game is based on the rallying speech real-time nfl coach marty schartenheimer gave the cleveland browns on the afc championship game in 1989 very awesome did they win that game uh marty schartenheimer game no yeah <laughs> you know they didn't win no Mar- well that marty schartenheimer i couldn't uh just when I'm the- seeing him with his glasses right now standing there on the sideline when they'd get all foggy, when it would be rainy, and I'd be like, this guy looks lost. But he was not a bad coach, I guess. He just sometimes looked lost. Yeah, they lost to Denver. <laughs> 37, <laughs> 37 to uh, 21. And whoever went against, the, the team was going up against San Francisco, who just demolished 55 <laughs> to 10 against Denver. Wow. Uh, that's hilarious, though. Sam says he's only saying it once didn't care for it. It's a hit or miss film. Definitely is. It's, Oliver Stone's films are hit or miss. A lot of them. Uh, Jane said knock you out. <laughs> well, I love got him for a knockout. But uh, when I saw that film, I automatically thought of the Pacino speech and the Willie Beeman music video. Because <laughs> I'm Willie Beeman. <laughs> I love the fact that you played it because I was actually thinking about using it as our uh, lead in. But the Jim Brown, I don't have strokes. I give strokes. Always cracks me up. (laughs) 
I mean, there's so there's the movie is long. So I mean, I could sit here and you could have chopped it down for an hour and made it a better movie, I think. But that being said, you could also what we used to do back in the day, which nobody does this anymore, nobody. But you'd sit there and take DVDs and just watch the cool parts of the movies, and there are some cool parts in this movie. Um, and I'll argue with you about Oliver Stone at another time. So let's move on. <laughs> oh man, let's move on to our next one, our man. Featherstones off to the races. No throw to Stone. He's wide open. Well, that's nothing new. Can he catch the ball? He caught it! Oh my god! Featherstone caught the yeah. ball! It's a touchdown! 1991's Necessary Roughness, directed by Stan Gregati, who also directed one of our favorites, Mr. Mom, Dirty Little Billy, The Man with One Red Shoe, which is I thought was a crazy name, and She's Out of Control. The film stars Scott Bakula, Hector Elizondo, Harley Jane Kozak, Larry Miller, Robert Lagosha, Sinbad, and Rob Schneider. The film had a box office of $26 million on a $13.5 million budget. This is a film I discovered on USA Up All Night. I happened to come on. i never seen it before. And for some reason, I just thought it was hilarious. Uh, Jason Bateman's in this film, like an early appearance by him. Uh, Rob Schneider is actually likable in this role uh, as the announcer. Uh, it's just about a team that basically, a football program that basically gets screwed over because their players are taking a uh, money from donors and they're on steroids they win the championship and they get banned they bring in a coach straight arrow Gennaro and hector elizondo to come clean up the program and you have scott back as a 34 year old uh freshman they bring out from the cattle who's a this badass football player in his teen days and they're basically trying to win their first game uh and they get better as they go and who can forget kathy ireland as lucy <laughs> uh I like this film a lot. It always, uh, it's still, I still watch it every once in a while. I actually wrote a blog about it. Uh, one of the famous lines is, "We like to partay." <laughs> uh, so it's a, it's a, it's an enjoyable, enjoyable film. Kathy Ireland's awesome. Uh, Scott Bakula's awesome. Sinbad is awesome. It's a, it's a fun one. What about what do you? Think about this one, Tom? Why does anybody ever talk about Paul's brother, Marcus Giamatti? Uh, who stars in this movie as Sargi Fumbelina Wilkinson. Mm -hmm. uh, not many people know that Paul's got a brother, but he does, and he's in Necessary <laughs> Roughness. Um, Sinbad, awesome, um, around this time period. Again, another box I remember seeing at the video store, and I just stared at it because of the cool football with the mustache and the, the hat, and just a really fun movie. Yeah, definitely. Uh, Sarge also had like an obsession with the military in his uh locker it said saddam this bombs for you and they had like pictures of colin powell <laughs> and they also he couldn't run a running play they try to give him a handoff and he just gets stuff every time uh also samurai <laughs> their only defensive player was samurai who was just those and kicks the shit out of people <laughs> as their uh he was a linebacker it's just a fun film they're playing iron man football robert lagos is hilarious uh as wally it, it's it's not the greatest film, but to me, it's it's like a classic. It reminds you of like, even though it's ninety one, it gives me that eighties feel, like the eighties feel of comedy, it does. and that's that's why I enjoyed it so much. It does. It gives you that feeling of uh, like a, you know, I always say it so many times, but it's it's, it's a feeling that I, I don't know if you could even emulate anymore. You could put a whole set of encyclopedias on that show. Yeah, he was a big man as uh, Andre Krim. Big dude, and he uh, was a vegetarian. Remember, he told Robert Lagosha, Andre doesn't eat meat. Andre's a vegetarian. Uh, but yeah, definitely check this one out if you haven't. It's one of those, you know, it has, you have a great appearance by Dick Buckus, who might show up in one of our other movies later on. Uh, Dick Buckus is in the film, as well as um, Evander Holyfield. Uh, who else is in there, uh, Tone? I think Jerry Rice, Tony Dorsett, I think is in it. Errol, Errol Campbell, I know, is in it for sure. Uh, here we go. Um, Herschel Walker, Jim Kelly. Yeah, they're all in as the cons. And when they tackle the shit out of Scott Bakula, he goes, mm -hmm. what are you in for? And the guy's like, computer fraud. 
<laughs> that was always cracked me up. Uh, but yeah, it's definitely a fun film that gives you that 80s feel. Uh, Sinbad's awesome. And like Robert Lagosha going off is pro- prime Robert Lagosha. Oh, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> I just think of him as Feach. So. Feach, yeah. And this one, he gets the Feach this in this one too. Like, uh, stop being, you gotta attack the damn ball like an animal. Let us pray. <laughs> I know you don't like the movie and you've said negative things, but he is amazing in Scarface. Uh, no, he's not. He <laughs> I love I love Robert Lagosha. He but... is. He's really awesome in that role. Because but... he was a stoolie. <laughs> you also like the Blair Witch Project. So never mind. I do like the original Blair Witch Project. But, but I, I, I bet if we lined up a bunch of people, we'll find more people that like Scarface than the Blair Witch Project. I'm sure they will, and that means a bunch of people will be wrong. <laughs> <laughs> uh, but uh, let's get to your next one, man. Let's do it. But I'm angry. I'm, I'm spitting angry. I'm like a tornado of anger swirling about. My heart rate is dangerously high right now. Wait, this isn't a football movie. Well, it is, it is a, a football, football movie. movie because <laughs> there's two types of football. There's football Americano and there's football in Europe, which is soccer. So 2005's Kicking and Screaming, directed by Jesse <laughs> Dillon, who also did American Wedding, how High and Soros, the film stars Will Ferrell, Robert Duvall, Kate Walsh, and the coach Mike Dicka at a box office of $56 million and a $45 million budget. Tell him, tell me why you picked this one. Movie surprised me. Um, at the time, I did not think that this movie was going to really be any good. But kind of like the little giants, it's kind of, to me, along of the same kind of uh, formula. Um, I like just the interludes between him and Robert Duvall. Um, we've talked about Robert Duvall before on the show, um, but this is Robert Duvall in a comedy role. Very, very serious. But I also like Will Ferrell, too. I think he does a, a good job. I'm, honestly, he's not. I'm not the biggest Will Ferrell fan. Um, I think he's downright stupid at times. But in this movie, I think he tries to play it one of his more straighter characters besides some of the more serious movies he's released but uh i enjoy again just the uh sports aspect and i was thinking when we were going to do the show are we ever really going can we ever do a five on five soccer show um do they have they made that many movies i love mean machine um there is a couple other movies that have soccer in it so i said to myself how do we sneak this in that's also the reason why i picked it because i don't know if we'll ever be able to talk about this movie besides on this show tonight well, if we do a Will Ferrell deep dive, I mean, this will be that's true. Night. But you know, I don't. I will never vouch for that. So you'll have to come <laughs> to me for a five on five Will Ferrell, and it will. That will be the least, as I just stated. This is a film that doesn't get talked about a lot in terms of Will Ferrell's filmography. It's kind of one that kind of hides under the radar, which kind of surprised me that this film actually made money um, with fifty six million on a forty five million dollar budget. I saw it twice. Uh, both with my younger cousins while we watched it. I thought it was okay. Mike Dicka was pretty hilarious in it. Uh, I just remember like there's a scene where Robert Duvall's punching a ball, like the ball that spins, and he just looks so old. And like seeing Robert Duvall like kind of be like the grandpa of age. It really like, it's like when I watched The Judge. I remember him in The Godfather and him in colors. Like he's always kind of the older guy, but when he got old, old, I'm like, man. This guy's getting, you know, getting super old. So it kind of like uh, put me in perspective how he, to go back and watch his other films because he's a phenomenal actor. Uh, he also did the, he, was he in The Apostle, right? He yes. did The Apostle, yes. That was a good film too. Um, but this film, uh, like you said, Feller plays more of a straight character, though he does have his goofy parts in it. Uh, I enjoyed it. It's a kid's movie, uh, but it's enjoyable. I mean, Roger Ebert, this I'll say, he gave it three out of four stars, which is probably what I would give it. And he calls it, you know, just an entertaining family movie. When I saw it, we were waiting for a party to go down at Ball State. And we were just sitting there on the couch. <clears throat> and we were, uh, I don't know, just started watching this movie. And it surprised me because I had no interest to probably ever watch this movie. I wasn't sitting on that couch at that moment. And sometimes <laughs> a movie has to, you have to be like, be put on at a time where you're not really going to watch it. But uh, again, I enjoy uh, the performances in this one. You know, 
I don't know why, but when you're like, I was sitting on the couch, I automatically in my head spawned the scene from Billy Madison when he's trying to spell, when the girl has to spell couch. And mm-hmm. she's like, sounding out wrong. He's like, wrong. <laughs> I don't know why it just popped in my head, but yeah, this one's a, a good one. It's a kid's film, but it's, it's, it's a good one, like a nice little hidden gem to check out from Farrell's filmography. And, it, you know, most of his films aren't really kid friendly uh, besides Elf. Uh, yeah. A lot of them had a lot of adult jokes in them. Uh, but this one is uh, a good one to watch with the kids. Very good. Mm-hmm. Good pick. Thank you. And let's go into our next one, my friend, with one of your favorite lines. Your attitude's wrong. Your tone of voice is wrong. This is your opportunity. For here. you. Playing football at West Canaan may have been the opportunity of your lifetime. But I don't want your life. 1999's Varsity Blues, directed by Brian Robbins, who also did Norbit, Meet Dave, The Perfect Score, one of my favorites, Ray the Rumble, and Hardball, which is another one of my favorites. The film stars James Vanderbeek, John Voigt, Paul Walker, Scott Kane, Ron Lester, Richard Lineback, Amy Smart, Ali Lauder, and Thomas S. Duffy, and a box office of $54 million on a $16 million budget. This film was all over the place in MTV for the MTV Movie Awards. You got to remember Dawson's Creek was huge at the time. James Vanderbeek was the pretty boy of TV. Uh, it cracks me up that he has a Texas accent in here. Uh, but one of the things that drew me into this film was actually the way the football scenes are shot. It's actually shot really, really nice. It uh, gives you that Texas light, Friday Night Lights feel. Uh, it reminds you of high school. If you've ever gone to high school football games, I've gone to a bunch of them at Rita. You know, it gives you that feel. Uh, you have characters that are pretty hilarious, like Tweeter in uh, Scott Kahn's character, Billy Bob as Ron Lester. You know, you got John Voight. Uh, every time I see John Voight, I cannot not think of him as Sarone, but as the coach <laughs> Bud Kilmer. Uh, and then you got James Vanderbeek as this, you know, talented quarterback who only happens to start because Paul Walker gets hurt. And Paul Walker really broke his leg. Uh, it, it, it's pretty crazy when I read that. He actually broke his leg. But this film is also iconic, not just for the J- James Vanderbeek, I don't want your life line, but also the Ali Lauder bikini whipped cream um, get up that people have talked about even now. Uh, and it's crazy when I was doing research for this, that scene is... The most one of the most iconic scenes in film history, and possibly the most iconic moment of Ali Carter's career, and this is her film debut, so Ali Lauder's career. So that's that's um, if I was an actress, I don't know how I feel about that. <laughs> yeah, no, uh, you know, it's not what you want. I mean, especially if you start to have a family or kids or you're, you know, uh, excellent soundtrack. Um, mm-hmm. Soundtrack's got 15 tracks on it. Um, you got Loudmouth leading it off and of Fly. Mm-hmm. Nice guys finished last with Green Day, My Hero by Foo Fighters. I mean, the soundtrack was great, uh, including Hot for Teacher with Van Halen, a really good spot in the film with that. Um, <laughs> uh, honestly, you picked some of the best football movies of all time. This is definitely, I would put in the definite top three. Um, I'm a huge, I love the American Pie movies. Um, so I could say this gives me another feeling like that. It's teenage uh, angst. It makes you could look and find yourself in a character in the movie. Um, Scott Kahn is great. Um, always been a fan of Scott Kahn. Um, does a good job in this. Um, John Voight, man. I'm not saying uh, Academy Awards, but where were the Academy Awards? <laughs> <I'm> just, <laughs> I mean, he just plays the role such like a scuzz that I, I think he just does a – he is – well, I don't want to – judge john voight from i haven't met him but from what i see he seems not to be somebody that we would get along too well with but uh that being said he's a great actor like you said about roman polanski you know i don't really like him much about his person but got some pretty good movies yeah sam says uh, i did what we did in the biz call foreshadowing earlier yes sam you were foreshadowing (laughs) uh ron lester who plays billy bob Went on to parody his role in not another teen movie as uh, Bobby Bill or something like that, which I thought was hilarious. He also lost a ton of weight. Uh, he's in another film from my childhood called Good Burger. He was uh, Spatch. 
That's a spatula. Yeah, so I've seen that. That's awesome. He's in that. I didn't even know that. Yeah, he's the cook. Uh, That's awesome. But yeah, this film is it's one of the teenage growing up films. I was 14 when this film came out, so of course I watched it. Uh, when reading about research for this film, Daniel Stern was originally going to direct the film. Now, Daniel Stern, who we know as um, Lloyd from probably you know, the Home Alone series or um, a lot of people don't know he did the voiceover for The Wonder Years. He was actually the voiceover for that. Uh, he only directed one Chud film. Chud too, if you like horror films. Yeah. Oh yes, he is in Chud. Uh, he was also directed one film and that was Rookie of the Year. That's, that's right. <laughs> so the fact that he was going to direct this film makes me laugh because it would have been totally different. Uh, but he got fired. <laughs> so uh, he couldn't uh he couldn't do it but yeah this film is just a bunch of nostalgia from the 90s i do love all the football scenes in it. i actually uh sometimes will pop it on just for the football scenes because the action in it's really good uh, i also love the soundtrack too uh loud mouth um uh air is like a great tune i actually remember when this came out i had you know i didn't have kazaa like a lot of people did i had used soul seek so i actually ripped the album from there to play it uh and i would play this album while i did homework or whatnot in high school <laughs> that's it's, it's 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 a movie that to me it doesn't really get old at all mm-hmm. it's 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 timeless it's a timeless movie for sure man uh i really like it like this movie but uh let's go into another film that is timeless my man your next pick now we're four points behind. We can push right past these guys, right? Right. Yeah. Now you don't sound very convinced. Come on, don't you guys have any pride? Yeah. Don't you have any guts at all? Yeah. All right, then, get out there and get tough. Yeah. Get clean. Yeah. These cougars will be nothing but a fur ball when we get done with yeah. them. Yeah. Yeah. Let's go eat some pussy. Yeah. Yeah. 1986's Wildcats, directed by Michael Ritchie, who did The Golden Child. Fletch, The Island of 1980, and Cool Runnings. The film stars Goldie Hawn, Twoozy Kurtz, Robin Lively, Wesley Snipes, Tab Thacker, Bruce McGill, James Keach, and Woody Harris. The movie had a box office of 26 mil. Tone, tell us about Wildcats, my man. Um, I had a choice. It was either going to go with this, or I was going to go with our other main man, Kurt Russell, in The Best of Times with uh, yeah. Robin Williams. But I picked this one because, again, um i like movies where especially in the 80s where they're throwing you for a curveball so this movie throws you for the curveball because goldie hawn's gonna be the coach of this football team um great performances by woody harrelson um ll cool j's even in it lower down in the cast he plays a rapper a real Mm -hmm. small role in the movie um nipsey russell as the principal ben edwards does a really great job um again Reminds me of an 80s more, I mean, it's not as tight as Varsity Blues, but another 80s movie taking place um, that you really can kind of enjoy uh, the characters, okay? Um, Taking place in uh, Chicago, too, is uh, really kind of cool in the the plot. Because, well, we're kind of from near there. But again, great performances by everybody. Goldie Hawn does a really 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 good job um i like reading always negative reviews of movies that i enjoy because it makes me laugh um you know gene siskel says pathetic sports comedy like again it's a it's not we're not trying to rewrite the wheel here again you just need to fall for the fact that goldie hawn's going to be coaching these guys and it's there's going to be that's the interaction of the humor so I actually like that kind of stuff. And when I see stuff like that, it doesn't make me mad. It makes me laugh. Like they must have had a bad day that day to judge this and watch this movie because it's just, it's loose and it's fun. I love Gene Sisko. Uh, he could be wrong. I mean, Roger Eberts can be wrong too. Oh, yeah. It's all like uh, film is all subjective. So it depends. I mean, we, I do think they like, we talk about critics, they're the best of all time. But like, even like when, when we had talked to Roper, he said, you know, it's all subjective, you know. He's not the um, the be all end all film. He's just giving his opinion, just like you and I. I, I don't like Scarface. Yeah. You like Scarface. 
Oh, yeah. uh, this film I think is pretty awesome because it takes the element of football and then you throw in a female coach into the you know there and it's something different and I always thought that was kind of cool of course I love Goldie Hawn uh, one I love her movies and two she's married to one of my favorite actors of all time Kurt Russell <laughs> um, well I mean you go and you look and somebody else says this mm-hmm. this was another reviewer um mm-hmm. Roger Pian Dosi said, uh, a slick, fitting, charming little comedy that does nothing to deter those of us bent on being fond of Goldie Hawn forever. So, I mean, like, that's it. Like, I love Goldie Hawn overboard. I love, you could put Goldie Hawn as just house a, guest. Yeah, house guest is great. Yeah, yeah. So, I mean, that's what it comes down to is like, that's it too. Yeah. And it, it's, it's a fun film. You have two debuts, one, the credited film debut of Woody, Woody Harrelson. And then you had the debut of Wesley Snipes, who went on to have big careers, and they eventually did Money Train together, <laughs> which I thought was hilarious. Yeah, uh, and White Man Can't Jump. Yeah, White Man and White Man Can't Jump, another film. Uh, you, again, you have uh, L.O. Kuj in here, who did a song, uh, a football rap, which appeared during the opening credits, but didn't make it to the soundtrack, which I thought was kind of weird uh, when I read this. It's one of those films that, you know, tried something different. It has comedy in it. It has a player that takes... You know, money to play in Finch and Tad Thacker, and I always remember him from uh, Police Academy movies. Oh yeah, uh, but you know, uh, it's something to try something different, and it was enjoyable. It it was a it had its funny moments, and you know, Goldie Hawn is awesome, and it's based in Chicago. Like, how can you hate on it? That's true. Very true. Yeah, but this is a good pick, Tone. Uh, Beef Loaf talks about this film all the time. <laughs> Classic. He knows the good stuff. Yes, he does. Uh, this is the second sports film released by Warner Brothers um, until the end of the decade, which started with Vision Quest in 1985, and then they followed with Over the Top in association with Canon Films. They have Bloodsport in 1998, again in association with Canon Films. Everybody's All American in 1988. Stealing Home in 1988. And your favorite, and my, I'm not Larry's favorite, Candy Shack 2 in 1988. <laughs> um, but yeah, this is a good pick, man. Very awesome. Thank you. Mm-hmm. Let's go on to our next one, my guy. You're out and you're ready. Yes, sir. All right. This is Mississippi State's offensive set. Second and two on our own 24. What defensive set might we call? Eagle zipper hero, unless the setback shifts into the eye. Good. Third and seven. Okie Thunder Lion. What's your assignment? Kill the quarterback. Hit the tight end so hard his girlfriend dies. Kill everybody. 1993's The Program, directed by David S. Ward, who also did Major League 1 and 2, King Ralph, Down Periscope, and he wrote The Sting and Sleepless in Seattle. This film stars James Kahn, Holly Berry, Omar Epps, Craig Schaefer, Andrew Brnanarski, and Dwayne Davis. The film had a budget of $15 million and a box office of $23 million. Uh, this is kind of funny because we had var- I had Varsity Blues with Scott Kahn and James Kahn in this film. And I had Necessary Roughness, both films that have Dwayne Davis in it, which I didn't realize <laughs> that until now. Uh, but Dwayne-, Dwayne Davis is a totally different character in this film than he is in Necessary Roughness. Necessary Roughness, he's a wacky wide receiver. In this film, he's just a badass linebacker. Uh, the program is more of a serious you know, take on college athletics and mostly college football when they're getting paid by the boosters and what certain college programs can possibly go through to have their players pay. Uh, Dwayne Davis, uh, his character in here, was basically didn't even know how to read, but he was playing in a college, you know, big college program because he could play football. And that's basically why he was at that university on a full ride. But he couldn't read. Uh, they make fun of him in it. And then, of course, you have uh, Brynarski, who is the fucking steroid ass dude that is like, he was pretty freaking scary. And even watching this film back, like, that dude was gigantic. The part where he puts the, uh, the skeleton makeup on towards the end mm-hmm. and he's just screaming, I'm like, holy shit, dude, that guy is ridiculous. Uh, it has Christy Swanson in this, a young Holly Berry, a young Omar Epps. Really, really different film. Uh, not a completely great, great film, but I like the way I try to do something different and try to show like that collegiate sports can be corrupt, which I thought was pretty cool. 
What do you think about this one, Tom? I mean, this is probably the te- the top of the peak of my football movie uh, enjoyment. Like, because it's got it's it's full of ridiculousness. Um, it's also full of like some pretty okay performances. Like James Conn does a really good job in this movie. I think as the coach, um, but James Conn is playing James Conn. You know, again, another actor. Um, for me, you could put him in pretty much anything, and he does a pretty good job. Um, again it's a time period piece for me because I watched it like the year came out. So like for me, shouldn't have been watching this at 12 or 13, but I'm watching it. And honestly, uh, what I remember always and will always remember is the steroid dude. And we would talk about it all the time um, because the way he just acts in this movie is completely ridiculous. And honestly, that's what makes it even more ridiculous. His character, um, when he traps, uh, Matthew Modine in the toilet and any given Sunday when he's taking a crap and he traps him in there because he's trying to give him the IV in the toilet or whatever. It's just, again, ridiculous performances. And this is a really great, uh, early nineties indication of some, uh, you know, some, some good football, uh, college, um, in a movie. Yeah. That him, like the part where he's with the girl. That's like, what I was going to bring up. And I didn't even know how to say it. It was just yeah. so like, whoa. Like he's gigantic compared to I mean. her. And it's no. like scary. Off topic. I don't know if you've ever seen this before, but if you've not, yep, I'm going to find it and we're going to watch it. Have you ever seen the after school special? It was about steroids. It was on ABC. It was in the early nineties. And well, it stars Ben Affleck mm-hmm. and he is, uh, in high school and he gets involved with steroids and it's honestly it's like high school ben affleck's version of this character um look this up if you get a chance and watch some of him in that like there's a scene where affleck again um his girlfriend's in the room looking through his stuff and she finds the steroids and he loses it kind of like just over the topness which body to die for yes that is the name of the movie. I forgot the name, but we would always talk about that movie too because I'd never heard of that. And a friend in high school was like, you ever see that movie with Affleck where he's got steroids? I'm like, no. But again, um, I don't want to make jokes because steroid abuse is not funny. But again, this is where it leads you if you do it. So it's like, that's why I've always been like, when people do steroids, you're, I automatically think of the guy in the program. That's yeah, definitely like, I, and I and I lit and I lift the weight, so it's like not like oh okay I don't do that. It's just more of a little over the top, not yeah. the uh, Stallone version. <laughs> yeah, this one is uh, definitely uh, that. That this guy definitely plays a role to the max. Uh, I did find the main character, um, what's his name, uh, Craig Schaefer's Joe Kane. His line, his uh, I, his line was really corny. Let's put the women and children to bed. <laughs> I was always like, it was always so horrible. But uh, one of my favorite parts I loved about the film, though, was when it's the final play and he goes to quiet down the crowd and it gets super quiet. Like you hear a pin drop before they snap the ball, <laughs> which I thought was pretty awesome. Uh, but yeah, it's totally uh, a different, unique film. Uh, a lot of good football action, too. And Alvin Mack by Dwayne. Davis is my favorite character in the film because all the shit talking he talks to the other players as he's about to tackle them because he makes up scenarios in his head to get mad at them kind of like pre water boy uh, <laughs> like a normal water boy but it's just it's just funny uh, but yeah if you haven't seen this one check this one out it's definitely worth the watch um, I gotta always bring up because uh, now I, you brought you um, we're gonna do a tie in here and, and I'm gonna bring it together you are recently for our what we have been watching had uh, talked about the Roseanne Halloween episodes. Now, our, do you remember when they did the flashback and Dan was in high school, this gentleman here on the screen next to the cutout, he was the one who played high school Dan? Yeah. Which, honestly, this dude, since I've seen him as high school Dan, and then in this, I'll always think of him as high school Dan. So, again, great movie you picked here, young. Thank you. Yeah. He was in a uh, Fred Flintstone costume. Which is he was. Yes. Which is kind of funny because John Goodman played Fred Flintstone. That is true. Uh, but yeah, <laughs> crazy stuff, man. <laughs> uh, but let's get into uh, your next one, my man. No one can stop a ticking clock, but the 
great ones, the great ones always find a way to slow it down. 2014's draft day. That's the best clip I could find that wasn't uh, you, you pancake eating motherfucker. <laughs> uh, this movie is directed by Ivan Reitman, who did Ghostbusters 1 and 2, Kindergarten Cop, Stripes, Junior, and Evolution. The film stars Kevin Costner, Chadwick Boseman, Jennifer Garner, Frank Langella, which is another, uh, we talked about him in Ninth Gate, uh, mm-hmm. Patrick St. Espert. And Chai McBride, the movie had a budget of $25 million and a box office of $29 million with $12 million in home video sales. Tone, tell me about the draft day, my man. Uh, this is another one that, uh, not Larry, if you're out there, you know, um, I know you like this one. Um, but that being said, uh, I, again, stumbled on this one. Um, it was on back when HBO used to be an actual channel that played movies repeatedly and I had cable. Um, I would love to catch movies that like I had never no interest in watching. And then I'd be like, okay, this isn't terrible. Now uh, this movie could be weighted as terrible by some. Um, I enjoy it because again, it's just, there's a lot going on in this movie, um, which I bet there's a lot going on in an actual draft day. Um, But just a lot of actors that are just, in this movie and play great roles from what I mean they're trying to do. There's also an underline. What I'm trying to say is there's some cheesiness to it. I mean, come on, man. Dennis Leary is the head coach of the Browns. I mean, there just was a, um, a stand-up special and Dennis Leary is in the, at least the top 30 of stand-up com- comedians of all time. So to see him playing a serious coach, uh, a, a head coach of the Browns, um, nonetheless, um, I really, really like Jennifer Garner in this movie. Um, if I was friends and I don't know her personally, but if I was friends with Ben Affleck, that was always something that really bothered me is we probably get in a fist fight because Jennifer Garner just seems very, very nice. And like, why would you ever want to hurt her? And this is another movie where like I see her and, but, but that is acting and she could actually be very scary behind closed doors um but that being said uh the performance is kevin costner i am a kevin costner fan i think he does a good job in all of his sports movies um to different wide degrees um easy light on your feet movie um you know i, I don't know you know I, I like it for for it's 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 aloofness i guess which is not really something that people like movies for, which is what this is a movie that I can see people not liking and I'm not going to come out on the winning end of trying to defend it. It's just, I like it for, I caught it at the right time. I think. It's funny that you basically want to fight an athlete because of Jennifer Garner. <laughs> I know. <laughs> and honestly, there is not a whole lot of people I've ever said that, but I just always have seen, she's just like, and everything I've seen seems so nice. And every time I see his face, he looks like, like he's upset or mad, and he's breaking up with uh, or uh, the other one again, and he just doesn't seem happy. And you know, he seems like a guy who, like, she just seems to be somebody who just probably wanted to be your normal wife, and he's somebody who he looks like he likes to have his fun sometimes. Uh, he's a recovering stuff. alcoholic. Well, that's what I mean. So, like, that's when you were, uh, I could imagine. And this is, I'm not, but I can imagine if you are an alcoholic or recovering alcoholic and you're in a relationship with probably your significant other is more of a straight and narrow, um, it drives you more away from that person generally because sometimes, but that being said, um, Kevin Costner and her uh, do a good job in this movie and uh, Cleveland Browns don't get a whole lot of love. So if I can give them some love in this, uh, this movie, you know. Because football movies are generally crazy how they actually pick the, the the team that they're actually like rookie of the year. What made them pick the Cubs? Because they're bad. Well, I mean, well, and I guess in that regard, <laughs> well, I guess in that simple regard, yes. I, I you know I'm thinking in more of the guards. Why didn't they pick like the Pirates? Well, they played the been... Pirates. He played for the Pirates, I guess, and is a little league team. Okay, but you know what I mean. My point is, is that it's a selling, it's a selling tool. So, like, I don't really know why they made this movie the uh, draft day. He was in charge of the Browns. They could have made it the Chargers. Well, I'm gonna tell you why. Here we I go. have the answer. I had the answer to. See, that's why I set you up for you, bro. I was waiting for you to 
to bite. So go. Uh, the movie originally centered around the Buffalo Bills instead oh. of the Cleveland Browns, but the studio changed it to the Browns because the production costs in Ohio were cheaper. <laughs> so it came down the money, Tony. Look at- <laughs> Which it always does, doesn't it? I could imagine that you know Wrigley Field, even when they were sucking, still filled up the the you know the friendly confines. So of course they weren't make a movie of Rookie of the Year in the red like of a team that nobody's going to go see. You know, Cubs Rookie of the Year. My uh, year. my high school Spanish teacher was actually uh, extra on Rookie of the Year, and she got kicked off. Really? Yeah, because uh, they told her uh, not to stare at the camera, and she they were supposed to chant henry at the camera and she's like she looked right at the camera was like henry henry and you're like yeah you gotta get out of here yeah so that's pretty funny uh this film though does have some stuff that was actually you know based on some true story uh the trick used by the washington redskins of taping a 100 dollar bill to the back of a playbook seemed to be inspired by a guy by the name of Demarcus Russell, uh, his coaches in Oakland did not believe he was watching the game film and once purposely sent him home with blank DVDs to watch. He returned claiming he watched the video game, the video and liked the game plan, obviously lying. And there was a similar story in the 1980s with Randall Cunningham, both two totally different players. Cunningham was actually a better player than Demarcus Russell in the pros. Uh, but I thought it was pretty crazy that uh, they used that stories from those people and put them in here for how the playbook because Bull Callahan, you know, didn't read the playbook. Uh, and then, you know, of course, the quarterback that Kevin Costner has set the $100 back, which I thought was like, what the hell? Who does that? But uh, I like this film. There's not a lot of football playing in it. There's a lot of footage. Uh, I love the analytical talk about it. I like the behind the scenes. I wish they would do something like this, like Moneyball, I thought was awesome because they did kind of the building of a team. But I want to see like more in depth, like the off season, going to the GM meeting, stuff like that in baseball. Like to me, that would be a great like series. Like I thought Arliss was awesome for uh, the, even though it was in a more comedic fashion, but the sports agent, getting, yeah. you know, I want to see something like behind the scenes of like baseball, like going through that whole the you know, grind of staying up and researching players for drafting, and then going behind the scenes of meeting them, and then. You know, going to the winter meetings and do all this. I love that aspect. I think this film kind of peeks but look behind the curtain for a little bit for us in terms of the GMs and how they go down the draft day. Now, everything in this film is kind of unrealistic. I don't think it would work out that way. But like I said, one of my favorite lines in the film is, Come on, you pancake eating motherfucker. And this is the only PG 13 film to have use the term motherfucker, <laughs> which I thought was great. Uh, you also have uh, Chadwick Boseman as Vontae Mack, and you always go with Vontae Mack. Uh, I love when he calls Kevin Costner's like Vontae Mack supposed to be number one, uh, be number seven pick. He, he ain't no ten pick. He, <laughs> when he tries to talk him up, uh, but they had a pretty sick team going into the season. They had a number one pick of Vontae Mack. They had a, a running back, and they had a punt returner <laughs> to go along with all their picks. Which I thought was crazy. So he wheeled and dealed. Uh, it had to be the Browns, you know, who you give that feel good story. And unfortunately, they're in uh, you know, the shitter again. But maybe they'll come out of it. I don't know. As long as they get rid of their quarterback. But uh, the screenplay for this film was featured in 2012's Blacklist, a list of the most liked unmade films of the year. And I agree. It's a, it's a awesome, uh, awesome film. Also, uh, Chadwick Boseman uh, agreed to take the role of Vontae Mack after a Skype call he had with director Ivan Reitman. Boseman wasn't sure if he wanted to play another athlete or do another sports film after 42, where he played Jackie Robinson. I like in the movie, that's what it was that I remembered. Uh, I liked um, I liked Kevin Costner like thinking about like his father in the movie, too. And like his mom was around Ellen Burstyn. She does a really great job in the movie. Also does a good job in his limited role as uh, Bo Callahan's coach at the University of Wisconsin, Mr. Sam Elliott. Yes. Um, just as, just, Bo just Callahan. Bo, Bo Callahan. Again, yeah. a lot, just a, a fun in that, in that way. Fun, fun, fun. 
Um, what's not fun is you brought his name up earlier, and sadly, he's in this movie. Uh, Mr. Baby Oil himself, um, Sean Diddy Combs. He plays Agent Chris Crawf Crawford, the number one draft prospect for Bo Callahan, which is a shame he's in this movie. Yeah. I was like, man, why is Puff Daddy trying to get... I still call him Puff Daddy. Why is yeah, he trying to get these roles? But I did find it hilarious that uh, you had Terry Crews playing the dad of the running back, which I thought was funny. Uh, and then, you know, Frank Langlia, who, uh, when he finds out they didn't draft Bo Callahan with the first pick, he walks into the office and he's like, you son of a bitch. <laughs> like, that scene yeah. always cracked me up, too. Uh, what's crazy, too, is I wonder if uh, Chi McBride from Let's Go to Prison, is this the same Chi McBride who is the president of the Seattle Seahawks in this movie? No, I'm just kidding. It's <laughs> two op totally opposite characters. Um, yeah, yeah. Again, though, I like also the mixture of, like, you got John Gruden's in there. You know, you got Ray Lewis. You got some some NFL. I always like when they mix that in there, too. Yeah, they get adds realism to it. And Sam, I'm pretty sure you are totally correct that Draft Day is George McCaskey's favorite film because, remember, George McCaskey came out and told Bears fans he does not know a lot about football, which is probably why our team is in the shithole that uh -huh. it is in. Uh, oh, God. Nice people, bad owners. Uh, but, um, yeah, Chima Grides actually in Suits. He plays this character called Terrence Wolf. He's a DA. He's probably, he's like a like a anti-hero villain guy. Uh Plays a dick, awesomely. Well, he, he's a good actor. I like him a lot. Yeah, he really is. Um, well, good pick, Tone. I really enjoy this one. Thank you. Let's move on to our last two, starting with mine. I know you're tired. I know you're hurting. And I wish I could say something that was classy and inspirational. But that just wouldn't be our style. Pain heels. Chicks dig scars. Glory lasts forever. Right on, sir. Right on, man. Right on. Two thousands, the replacements, directed by Howard Deutsch, with who did some kind of wonderful, pretty in pink, The Great Outdoors, and My Best Friend's Girl. The film stars Keanu Reeves, Gene Hackman, Brooke Langdon, Orlando Jones, Jack Warden, and Brett Cullen. The film had a budget of $50 million and a gross of $50 million at the box office. This is one of my picks. Uh, another film that when we talk football movies really doesn't get mentioned a lot in terms of like the big top of the ones. This is one of my favorite football movies because it adds a sense of wackiness to football action. And I really like Keanu Reeves in this role as... For one, he's played a quarterback from Utah twice, uh, from uh, Ohio State twice with Johnny Utah and Shane Falco. Uh, this film talks about a Sugar Bowl game that never happened. And the reason that they talk about the 1996 Sugar Bowl is because they didn't want to make any player that played in a Sugar Bowl to be feel bad because Shane Falco apparently sucked. Uh, but it's kind of got like, this is kind of like a major league water down, little water down major league version of football. I love Gene Hackman as the old coach. It's got uh, Nigel Gruff, uh, who is hilarious. John Favreau as uh, Danny Bateman, the <laughs> SWAT team officer. You know, uh, Ryan's Iffens plays Nigel Gruff, the uh, kicker, which I thought was uh, hilarious. And it's kind of based off a true story with the Washington. Um, team from 87 that had Joe Gibbs. I'm not going to say their name. I'm sorry. No, no, no. That's fine. Good job. <laughs> um, they had a team at 87 uh, that went to the playoffs with their scab players, even though they claim this isn't, there's mixed, there's kind of conflicting reports about that. But uh, Shane Falco was so good, meaning Keanu Reeves did so well as his character that he got a tryout offered to him from the Baltimore Ravens. To actually be signed to the team. That's and real. this film was released in 2000. The Ravens went on to win the Super Bowl six months later. Hmm. They said that he had real talent, but he just I mean, he couldn't do it. Uh, one more kind of somber note about this film. Michael Jace plays Wilkinson. And Michael J as a he's a criminal trying to reform. And Michael Jace is a real life criminal. He's in jail for uh, some bad, bad things. But uh, it's kind of ironic that he played a character a criminal in this film but uh tone what do you think about this one 
Uh, classic. I mean, classic uh, across the board. Um, again, I think when you look across the board at all Keanu's performances, um, as you were kind of talking about Will Ferrell's uh, kicking and screaming kind of being a little bit under the radar, um, this one is, I think, one of Keanu's under the radar performances, but like it shouldn't be. Um, it's another one that I think I was watching it at a family birthday party and my cousin put it on. And I, another one I just had never sat and watched, and it's fun. I like the idea of the movie too. Um, what, but these reviews that uh, that um, that these uh, reviewers put out, I have to read this one to you. Um, this is this is Mr. Ebert, Robert Ebert, Roger Ebert. He gave it two out of four stars, but this is what he said: a slap happy entertainment painted in broad strokes, two coats thick. Um, you know, again. It, that's a little hard. I mean, you know, it's, it, 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 I don't think it's, it's as thick as he's saying it is because the point of the movie is, is it's like loose. It's like loose fun. You know what I mean? That's what it is. Well, I'm going to read you a review. I just read right now. It's got a high rating from this person, but uh, this is from college kid, 2008, which apparently he was still in college when he wrote this 2007. Uh, he says, this movie ripped off Necessary Roughness. First off, this is a pretty good flick. Keanu Reeves gives a decent performance, and the rest of the cast does well within the course of the movie. The movie plot itself is a complete ripoff of the 1991 movie Necessary Roughness, starring Scott Bakula. From needing to start a team over in this movie due to a pro strike, and the other due to college violations, to an old quarterback with the what-if syndrome, even a love story portion. This film just updates and changes necessary roughness from a college football movie to a pro football movie. What do you think about that? I'll uh, tell you two things. I love necessary roughness. Uh, I think I might like this one a little bit more personally. Mm -hmm. um, I also, you're not, any movie that has Keith David in it and Jack Warden, um, I definitely think that uh, gets a little bit more play. Keith David playing the president of the Players Union. Yeah. Mr. They live himself, uh, the <laughs> thing. But uh no, I don't agree with that. No, no, I, I don't think it's a ripoff of uh, necessary they're two different roughness. kind of movies, yeah. Um, but uh, Sam giving us some breaking news. He say here, he says, uh, when my uncle Canoe or Keanu came to me with the script, I told him it's good, it's gold, and go for it. <laughs> wow, so this movie would not have been made without Sam Reeves. Wow, that is, that is crazy. Uh, so yeah. Sam, I, believe, I believe Sam was like two years old when this film came out. So <laughs> baby Sam, tell him. Uncle Canoe, aka Keanu, go for it. Thank you, Sam, because this is one of my favorite football films. Oh, uh, also has a, a lot of funny scenes in it with the cheerleaders. Uh, you have the electric slide for the I Won't Survive. Um, just the introduction of characters when they go down the you know the characters that were cut or didn't make the pros. Uh, when they do John Favreau's character, he just stuffs the guy's face in the fucking. Uh, He's making meth in the boiling water. He's like, oh, yeah, while he's doing it. It always cracked me up. And of course, Nigel, ole, ole, ole. The drinks are on the grusta. <laughs> uh, I love that uh, character, but it's a fun film. If you haven't seen this one, check yeah. this one out. Check it out. And to close it up, Mr. Burton, <laughs> we're going to go with this one. You think you're so fucking cool, don't you? You think you're so fucking cool. Well, this once, I would like to hear you scream in pain. Play some rap music. <laughs> 1991's The Last Boy Scout, directed by Tony Scott, who did True Romance, The Hunger, Days of Thunder, Revenge, Crimson Tide, The Fan, and Emily of Estate, or a few of the films he did. Starring Bruce Willis, Damon Wayans, Ch Chelsea Field, Noble Winningham, Taylor Negron, Joe Santos, Bruce, McG Bruce McGill, Halle Berry, and Chelsea Ross. This film had a budget of $43 million and a box office of $114 million. Now, people are going to say, Tony, this is the football movie. Tell them why it's a football movie. Uh, well... I mean, again, um, the backdrop of the film is football. So, again, it becomes, again, is it like necessarily like necessary roughness where people are playing football? Well, 
there are people playing football. Um, but the movie is about a football star who is temporarily not able to play because of an addiction issue. And he gets mixed in with um, Mr. Bruce Willis, who gives probably one of his greatest performances. Um, but overall, what it is, is that it is a, just to me, um, a great mixture of, well, first of all, Tony Scott does a very good job. If you're a fan of Days of Thunder, which they've just announced doing a sequel of, and you like the way like in the race car is shot, the football scenes in this movie are shot pretty well. It, it opens, the movie opens with uh, a, more football than actually that's in draft day. Um, there is actually a whole football scene out on the field, rain's playing and the coaches are coaching, everything's going on. And in the most insane thing I've ever seen in a movie, one of the football players takes out a gun and shoots somebody when he's running with the football, which gives it this few eighties, um, dark vibe. And honestly, there's just so many quotes in this movie that, uh, I remember at a way too young age could happen to anybody. It was an accident, right? You tripped, slipped on the floor, and accidentally stuck your dick in my wife. Um, again, I always just remember a lot of just ridiculousness in Bruce Willis in the way that uh, he says it. Right after that, his wife goes, don't you got any dignity left? And he goes, fresh out. He says it like the most calmest voice ever. Um, but back to the football part of the movie, um, Damon Wayne's, um He's believable in this movie, I think, you know, and this is the Damon Waynes that I know from in Living Color, comedy genius in a lot of different ways. Um, but playing a more in a serious role, I think he nailed the part personally. Yeah, I would say uh, he did. Uh, Bruce Willis's one liners and monologues in this film is hilarious. Uh, just the opening thing about playing rap music always cracked me up. The uh, part where he. <laughs> When we first are introduced to his character and he wakes up after the kids throw the uh, the, the squirrel. dead squirrel on him. Yes. And then he looks in the mirror and says, nobody likes you. <laughs> Basically, <laughs> to the mirror. That always cracked me up. Uh, this film actually set a little history because it was the first film in which a script writer sold a script for a million dollars uh, according to time magazine shane black was originally offered 2.25 million dollars by coraco pictures but decided to go at warner Bros. for a lower but record-setting bid of 1.75 million so that he could work with joel silver who had produced his script for lethal weapon 1987's film this record stood for 67 days until uh caraco purchased a screenplay by joe Esther Haas, which became Basic Instinct for $3 million. Um, apparently, people are having issues with the boxing match. They can't watch it. Uh, so, good job there, Netflix. Uh, but They better not mess up Raw or I'm going to be infuriated. They're going to mess up Raw just because I know you, you want to watch it. <laughs> this film uh, cracked me up because the ridiculousness of the story, but also... You know, Damon Wayne's character, and you see the kind of like that camaraderie between him and um, camaraderie between him and Bruce Willis. And the funny thing is, when I was reading about this, they did not get along at all. Yeah. Uh, and it's crazy because Danielle Harris, who we know from the Halloween movies, also she plays a daughter in this film. She's also found Roseanne a couple episodes. Uh, she said when she first met. Bruce Willis, uh, he said on the first day of filming, after doing her first scene, Bruce Willis told her, kid, this is my movie. Don't upstage me. <laughs> Although she initially thought that Willis was being mean, she later realized that that's just Bruce. He's just funny like that. He was actually paying me a huge compliment by saying that. I think she's being nice because a lot of people who've worked with Bruce, even though Bruce is probably one of my favorite actors, action stars, I've said he's not really a nice person to work with. <laughs> yeah, I've heard that. I've definitely heard that too. Um, but this one's an awesome film. Uh, Shelly Marcone <laughs> and uh, Chelsea uh, Chelsea Ross as the Senator Baynard. Um, so another crazy thing, Tone, is in the film we find out that like 
Bruce Willis used to work for Secret Service when Senator Boehner was his boss, and basically Senator Boehner was beating up a woman, and Bruce Willis knocked him out because he's beating on a woman. Well, in the original script, the entire third act was set on water. Also, Hollenbeck's grudge with Senator Boehner was completely different from the movie. In the script, Hollenbeck, who's played by Bruce Willis, was working security for the Boehner family when Louis Boehner, Boehner's son, kills a mother and her child in a drunken car accident. When Hollenbeck refuses to cover for the Boehner's, the president's son, they plant a kilo of crack in his house. <laughs> Louis Boehner was also a villain in the script, and in the end, both he and his father die. <laughs> oh, oh. Uh, and this film, I think, was a little bit better, but Shane Black and Tony Scott both said later years that the script that they originally came up with was better than the final film. I like what Roger Ebert said about this one. He said, a superb example of what is a glossy, skillful, cynical, smart, utterly corrupt, and vilely mis- misogynistic action thriller. Um, I'll always remember, and you know, I don't know if this made me stronger. It was more of a WTF moment was when my father said to me, uh, you're going to sit in this video store and I'm going to run home and you're going to wait till the copy of Last Boy Scout comes back. This is <laughs> like right when it releases. And I go home and my mom comes home and she's like, what'd you guys do? And I go, dad left me at the video store to wait for the Last Boy Scout. Uh, she wasn't very happy, but I'll always remember it. And then I got to watch the Last Boy Scout and it was literally... Uh, and ama- another just amazing movie that helped shape me. And um, the football parts in this at the ending, um, Bruce's little uh, jig that he does at the top of the thing, just to really, uh, I like the all around. I actually like the ending of this movie a lot. The way when they're walking away and they're like, yeah. Santa Claus. Yeah. Yeah. It's good. Good stuff. Yeah. Definitely a good film. Uh, I enjoy this one. I love Dwayne Wayne's character. Holly Berry is beautiful in this film. That song uh, that if you it's been a while if you've uh seen the movie, the song that's playing when he first goes to the club and she's on the stage and it's like riding on the rain. <laughs> yeah. With my horse. I always thought that song was just like, holy shoot. That's and a- uh Eddie Griffin is actually the DJ. He sure is. He sure is. So, uh, earlier pants. David Waynes is known for putting younger up and coming comedians in his films, as as most comedians are. Uh, he did the same thing with Bernie Mac and Mo Money. Uh, and again, Joe Santos, who's in this film, was actually uh, in the film with Damian Wayans for Mo Money, which I thought was kind of cool. Uh, another character I really like, Joe Santos's character. Uh, I loved him in The Sopranos as, as Angelo. Oh, yeah. um, another actor that doesn't really get talked about a lot, but uh, awesome dude. But yeah, Tone, this is a good film. Brought back a lot of memories for me. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Classic. Yes, sir. So that is our movies that we decided to go with for our football films. Some were American football. One was <laughs> football in Europe. But they are all football, so I hope you enjoyed them. Let us know if we skip one that you liked that we didn't mention uh, in the comments or just shoot us a tweet or a... I, I don't know what Blue Skies are called. Blue Sky thing. I what? do have a couple, though, that were shared with us that I promised awesome. uh, I would share on the show here with us, to, with you tonight, everybody. A couple. Um, Frank the K shared Invincible and The Replacements. Invincible's not a bad uh, football movie. Um, Mailman Jack, he uh, a movie he uh, stated was big fan. You ever see this one with Patton Oswalt? I have not. No, um, but I looked up the box and he looked really cool in it. With uh, he had like face paint because first I was like, big fan, he's a big fan of our show, and then I was like, wait a minute, that's got to be a movie, and it, it is obviously Patton Oswald, so we'll have to check that one out. Um, Sockside Pride, he picked any given Sunday, um, with an Al Pacino gif. Um, I believe your brother in law, he picked probably my favorite, the program. <laughs> Mm-hmm. Um, Al, he picked that. Uh, Fitz Magic picked one that I was actually going to pick, but I could just not cry on air after my long week this week. And that's Brian's song, uh, actual classic, another James Kahn, which would have been crazy because we would have had two James Kahn's back to back. Yeah, and and I believe uh, Jack Waters and uh, Jack uh, Warden's actually in that film as well. Yeah, 
And our main man who was sitting in the comments, he picked probably, honestly, the best uh, football movie of all time. Sam, he picked The Dark Knight Rises. <laughs> well, thank you, Sam. I remember that part where the stadium falls apart. I thought it was so he cool. Was I saw it on the trailer. <laughs> ah, that's a lovely voice. <laughs> oh, oh, Bane. Um, so that was a fun, fun topic, my man. Let's talk about what's coming soon, my guy. Let's do it. If I can find the video here. Let's get ready to rumble. Coming soon. Proximamente. Coming soon. Coming soon. All right. Well, we got coming up for you guys next week. We are having what would be called a movie friends giving where we're going to have some people on and we're going to talk about maybe the their favorite movie that they like to watch around Thanksgiving time, maybe instead of sports, maybe later at night. Um, it was always something that was huge for me to go see a movie possibly on Thanksgiving night after we were done eating. I'm curious to see what uh, who we are able to get on and who we are able to uh, talk to about this. It's going to be a good time. Yeah, just something a little different. Uh, we will be taking the week off after because uh, it is Thanksgiving, and I wouldn't expect you guys to watch us on your Friday, you know, after Black Friday. Uh, but uh, and I'll probably be overstuffed with food. I know Tony will be as well. Mm-hmm. Uh, but yeah, uh, something something we thought of to do some some fun, and then we'll go back into our regular scheduled program of deep diving into our next film. Uh, but this was a this was a fun idea I thought of, and Tony, I'm happy you went along with it. It's always nice to get the listeners into, uh, you know, get involved. involved with us. Yeah. So look forward to that next week. We'll have that up. Uh, we'll be going live at eight o'clock. Uh, I'll be setting out. Uh, I've talked to a couple people. I know you're talking to a couple people yep. um, to get. So we got some people lined up, but uh, we got some fun stuff coming forward. Yeah, and honestly, uh, what I like is that we will, uh, by probably the end of this year, have close to 40 episodes. And what we do is, in my head, and I know you feel the same way, is then next year we just take the next step. We keep growing and keep Mm -hmm. bringing you awesome movies and keep having a good time. Yes, uh, we are growing pretty well. We're up to, I believe, 692 subscribers now. Uh, we've got what I want is I want a knock at your door and it's Joe Montaigne and he's like Tony sent me to just say hello you know like that's how big I want to be where you're like Joe Montaigne's at my house I didn't know he was coming and I'll tell him I thought he was gonna send Joe Montana <laughs> <laughs> great you ever see that Saturday Night Live when he hosted yeah that's great I love Joe Montaigne uh yes. Joe Montaigne is actually one of my favorite films uh revolving around chess and that uh, is uh Searching, searching for Bobby Fisher. Bobby Fisher. Yes. That's, a good, that's uh, actually a good movie. Joe Montana is awesome. Um, I always like to listen to his his ta- takes on sports as well. Actually, uh, happy birthday to Joe Montana. His birthday was this week. Yes. Yes, yes, yes. And if you have not got a chance yet, two movies that are just this uh, weekend have been released on streaming. If you did not get a chance to see Twisters, that's on Peacock. Mm. And uh, this uh, new movie with June Squibb that I've been really wanting to check out with uh it was richard roundtree's uh last movie um that just got released on hulu um i'm gonna come up with the name of it here because i just forgot i watched the trailer before this but it's honestly june squib i turned to my wife and i said one day we're going to be really sad and lost because we don't have june squib anymore thelma is the name of the movie Mm -hmm. um she uh gets her um her money that she has held on to her whole life gets taken and uh, the police tell her there's no way to get back. So she teams up with Richard Roundtree to try to get this money back. Looks ridiculous. Um, uh, but right now, my buddy, who is, li- who is live texting me while we've been doing this, as he watches Twisters, he has stated, I hate the cast. This is bad. I really dislike the cast. He just keeps saying the cast is bad. So I'll have to watch this Twisters and get back to you maybe next week and see what I think of it. Yeah, let me know what, what, what you think about it. I haven't seen it. I definitely will check it out. Uh, this probably not this week, but I have time. I'll definitely check it out. Um, but that See, is what quick, before we go on a movie like that. 
do you will you could you work on a video while having it on or is it something that you think you have to sit down and actually watch it for like if i were it depends if it's a you mean a video for it or you mean just a video like in just general? A bit like you were working on the uh stan and ali video that you're talking about like could you no. put that on in the back no no i would have to because it's new i never seen it before i would i would have like uh even when i was watching the ninth gate today uh when i was working um in between like coding and whatnot i took breaks during coding and i would rewind the film because see because there's certain parts like integral parts of uh when he's comparing the books yeah um he, he i have to look at when newer movies i really can't now movies like gladiator that i can quote and like uh the crow or uh gotcha. you know, i'm in lost all those films I, I can leave them on the background and just laugh because i hear it, little parts coming up i was always curious with that because like for me like i could put on twisters in the background Mm. and my main key is if i lift my head up more than 10 times and i'm that interested i'll just start it again and watch it like actually sit and watch it yeah if i I, I don't do that then i'm just like yeah this is yeah well maybe maybe if katie wants to watch or something like me personally in terms of attention if touch is hard when you're doing yeah when i'm when i'm working it's like i have like this one track when i'm set on something i have to do it do it like it done and then when it comes to coding like sometimes i can zone out everything around me um but i do have it on for background noise of other movies but yeah that's a good question like uh i don't think everybody's ever asked me that <laughs> yeah, we fell into that one. Very <laughs> yeah. good one um but before we get to the sugar baggy soundtrack pick of the week just want to do say some housekeeping here as you know we will have a new show on friday we have uh mailman jack will actually be on that show too tone Bring it back the special delivery segment. Uh, so we'll have Mailman Jack on that I one. See what he picks, along with other guests. Uh, we had two getting draftees in here uh, within a very very short time span. We had one on Sunday where myself and Keelan did horror movie villains draft. That was a fun one. And then Brian did a show with Sam Reeves, who's in the comments, along with Nick Morowski of Good Guys Talk Back as well as Socks and Sober podcast. Awesome dude. He's been uh, done some stuff for us before on some of the pods. Uh, they did the com- comedian draft. Uh, Tone, did you agree with other comedians they drafted? Uh, they picked a lot of good comedians. And honestly, uh, at the top of the hookup on music's list is actually Nick. Um, I've been meaning to try to reach out to him because honestly, um, him going on with Sam and talking about The Doors, um, Doors are one of my favorite bands of all time, and I would just love to hear the kind of conversations we would have. And but the uh, comedy picks were were great. Um, of course, I did, did miss some a couple of my favorites, but that's a conversation for another time. Yeah, Sam asked, "What do you think about Krasinski being the sexiest man alive?" Tony, you're breaking thoughts. Oh well, you know what? He's earned it, and like I always say beauty is in the eye of the beholder so obviously some people had to think he was sexy because they picked him yeah um i'm gonna be honest with you i can give two shits about the sexiest I, mean, thing that's, that's, I mean i mean but that, more power to him man <laughs> more power to him like <laughs> jim <laughs> oh sam uh but yeah let's get into the uh soundtrack pick of the week, my oh, man. Uh, let me just find your thing here. The Sugar Baggy Soundtrack Pick of the Week. I got a bad Well, you said you had a bad week, yum. You know, how can I cheer up my good man? But maybe play a little red hot chili peppers, and you know what? Uh, digging into the soundtrack i had forgotten all of the different things that were on this soundtrack uh all i really have always thought about was uh uh, the chili peppers track but uh when you dig deeper there is a lot more going on on this soundtrack including uh slash doing magic carpet ride which is ridiculous um you got tainted love which was uh you know that's always a, a good one um, but sold a squeeze. Uh, REM doing it's a free world baby. Um, Paul Simon, Coda Chrome, um, did diggable planets doing little Renee. Um, a good soundtrack. Um, one thing though, Yump, 
uh, in a negative of our conversations is you've always seemed to put down that Red Hot Chili Pepper song every time I brought it up. You've always, what your comment has always been, has been, you know, that's a good song, but have you ever heard any of their other songs that were maybe lower hits? And I was like, I like that song quite a lot. And so uh, Yeah. I, I love Soul like Squeeze. Song. I know you like Soul Squeeze. But I know being a big fan of a band, a song like Soul Squeeze is probably more of a well-known song. And you often uh, like to suggest unknown songs, which I appreciate. Because honestly, being a big of a fan as you are of the Chili Peppers, you've turned me on to uh, quite a few B-sides. And when you've said that, that I did not know of. So I'm, I'm appreciative of you doing that. Um, and I'm appreciative of this soundtrack. Um, Conan's is not a bad movie either. Um, when you look at it, if you take the time and watch it again, um, you know, it's a good time and a good little soundtrack. Yeah. The only bad thing about Coneheads, uh, I love the movie. Don't get me wrong. Is that it was just released, I think like a little too late in terms of, uh, it was in the seventies when the movie was pop, when the show was popular on SNL and it's kind of got released in 93. So that kind of took away from nostalgia, I guess, from it. But, uh, I, I love that. Use the same daughter anymore because she. Yeah, so. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> yeah. They use the girl from uh, Major League Two yes. uh, as a daughter, <laughs> but the soundtrack is awesome. You, you know, Tain and Love, Soft Cell, which they made it seem like it was a brand new song in the yeah. movie. Um, but I love the Solo Squeeze. I love uh, you have you know little little Renee. I love that song as well. Uh, like. The whole point of Soul Squeeze, like the reason that it, that song sticks out to me, is because the Peppers had just broken up with Fashanti at the time. Yeah, uh, the video has Chris Farley in it. It has that, you know, traveling We're around cool circus. Video. Yeah, cool it, it reminds you of a uh, Carnival. You ever see that yeah. show on HBO? Good, good, a lot of good video. vibes there. Uh, and it's sad because it's a time where you know they didn't have their. Even though Frashanti's not the their original guitarist, they had LL Slovak. Uh, he was very close to LL, and he left. So this kind of it's a great song, but it kind of gives me like, oh man, it's when Frashanti left, and then he came back, and then he left again, and now he's it's back again. Melancholy. It's not only that; it's not it's a melancholy song itself. On top of mm-hmm. because if you're familiar with what's going on in the background, like the song doesn't necessarily leave me. And if they play it on XRT all the time, and I listen to it all the time, they don't. It doesn't leave me going like today's going to be a great day. You know, it leaves you more of like squeeze. Your soul's been squeezed, and and I guess when you look at it, I guess that's probably how they felt when he was uh, leaving the band. Yeah, I'm really happy they patched up things uh, with Chili Peppers. You know, relationship wise, and they got their demons out of the way. Uh, sir, <laughs> Sam says a network Netflix servers are crashing. Nobody can see the fight. Yeah, I was I was getting a bunch of tweets and texts about it. Sam, uh, yeah. people bet in the fight can watch it, which I thought was they have to like this. I'm guessing this is their test run with live movie TV tone. Well, they they've done a couple other test runs and it's on other couple things and it's every yeah. time it's failed. <laughs> but this was never gonna be a a big. Uh, how no, can you I, not get? Can I ask you a question? How at this point, Netflix has had a a streaming service longer than Hulu. I could be mm-hmm. wrong about that, but how can they not have all the shit all worked out? Well, there's a reason. Like money is one upkeep, and you know, Netflix. Although it says it's getting more and more subscribers, as profits have kind of shrank a little bit. Also, it's kind of like reminds me of the video, you know, I'm sorry if you're listening to this for movie talk, but in terms of technical talk, like the video game thing, like Destiny doesn't have dedicated servers. The game Destiny. Yeah. Expensive. They, I think they eventually did, but places like Call of Duty had dedicated servers for such an online platform of for a lot of people playing. They probably didn't anticipate how many people were going to join, but for something like this, when you have a big name like Mike Tyson, I think you should have been prepared for it. But companies are going to try to, you know, shave off money here and there. It's really expensive to have those servers, and the upkeep of them is ridiculous. Gotcha. Maybe. Makes mm-hmm. Oh, it makes sense when you say it like that. Yeah, maybe uh, it's what kind of increase their profits, uh, and so maybe they'll have better streaming equipment. Uh, I remember the MLB streaming service kind of when they first came out. 
didn't really have too many hiccups because they invested a lot of money into it. Uh, same thing with the WWE Network, which was basically modeled off the uh, MLB Network. Um, they used the same type of encoding and same type of um, bit, um, bit rate and whatnot, which I thought was kind of cool. Um, okay, that's enough to get <laughs> technical and nerdy. Uh, uh, but uh, yeah, it's probably one of the reasons. Netflix has gone from CDs to streaming completely, which is pretty crazy. I I think they still offer CDs uh, or DVDs. I haven't got one from them in a very long time. But hopefully uh, we'll be able to watch this fight tonight. Yeah. But that is our show. Just under a two-hour mark. So I'm sorry, Michael Cotton, we did not make it to two hours. But we'll do it next time just for you, buddy. Uh, hope you're doing well, man. Shout out to everybody who watched, listened, liked, commented. Shout out to Sam Reeves, Mailman Jack, uh, our man Baloney, Jenny, Miss Caitlin Reeves, Mrs. King, Mrs. Queen Ass, I'm sorry, and everybody else who was in our comments and tweeted at us and participated in the show. We appreciate you guys. We have fun doing this and we hope you guys have fun listening to us. We'll be back next week on Friday at 8. Tone uh, just released a new Hook up on music, my man. Tell everybody what it's about before we get out of here. Talking about the brand new Linkin Park album. You're looking about getting back to the late 90s, early 2000s. The new album is, sounds a lot better than the last couple Linkin Park albums. Check that out. Uh, Suki Waterhouse. We talk about Exodus. We talk about some um, Everclear. We talk about the sad passing of Quincy Jones. We talk about Lyle Lovett. Talk about how crazy it was that he got married to Julia Roberts and the middle of indiana in the early 90s we talk about a whole bunch of crazy stuff but uh tune in man a lot of good musical talk yep check it out check out the hookup on music uh he drops it every friday sometimes he's live and sometimes he does it from the drop just depending on how works treating tony but he does a great job with the show be sure to check it out be sure to look out for my video as well as check out the grafty pods and i know Bruhan luke has some uh talk of the ducks podcast uh dusting off some dust and getting back on um but thank you guys so much take it easy and we will see you next week and before we go we're hoping that maybe one day we can get bruhan luke to take us to every location that was in the program and we could film ourselves there no i'm just kidding that <laughs> take care everybody right, take care everybody bye thanks for listening to the at the show podcast a Sadistic Penguin Studios production. Game over, man. It's game over. What the fuck are we going to do now? What are we going to do? Maybe we could build a fire, sing a couple of songs, huh? Why don't we try that?